circumstances and everything that's going on in our crazy world now. So it's uh, hang in there. We'll get through it. And uh, welcome. Thanks for this opportunity. Thanks to Gary. We've been great partners doing some really good stuff lately together. And uh, it's a pleasure. And to my Haida team, DEA team, we're, uh, we're doing a lot on this side. And I just want to kind of get into it as far as who we are and what we do. I'm a special agent with the DEA. I've been for 29 years now. Um, real quick, as far as I've been in major cities pretty much my whole career, New York, uh, Philadelphia. I went down to Columbia, South America for three years, went into our headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. And now I've been back here in Newark for about going on nine years. So I, uh, I've been pretty blessed as far as my career and the opportunities that I have had throughout. I'm going to get rid of this phone call. I'm sorry. It's my desk phone. I'm just going to hang up quick. All right. Well, um, so, okay. so once again, if you've got a question for Chris, ask it. Don't let's not wait till we got uh, anybody have any questions. So along the way, it's not interrupting. It's actually asking questions. So um, we talked about this um, in advance. You can either chat, chat, uh, use the chat room, or um, actually raise your hand, and then somebody will will try to get to a call on you. Thanks, Gary. Yes, one hundred percent. I I definitely. Uh, endorse that. I love interaction. I, I love to know what's on your minds, what your questions are, what you're dealing with and things like that. So please don't hesitate. Don't, don't, don't worry about interrupting me. I'm more than happy to address any concerns or questions along the way. Um, so who are we? The Drug Enforcement Administration. I'm sure you've, so, you've seen a lot of TV shows or movies and how we're depicted and, and kind of sometimes maybe as cowboys and just kicking indoors. There's a lot more that goes into our jobs and, and who we are and what we do. So from the enforcement piece, the operation piece, as far as our special agents, what do we do? Our, our main goal is to reduce the drug supply, right? Which is quite an endeavor when you look at the, the supply that comes into our country um, from, from other countries, particularly the Southwest border. Um, we work to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking organizations. Like that's our main goal to kind of not be really at that street level, but the mid to upper level traffickers who are bringing in the large quantities of drugs that are entering the United States. So that's a big component of it. And we also have the regulatory side. So that means the regulation of pharmacies, doctors, manufacturers, producers. So that whole piece is their non-enforcement uh, investigators, but they regulate that whole side of it, which is very important as we continue to our conversation, we talk about this opioid epidemic and the role that they play within this. And then where we're putting a lot of resources in our prevention and outreach, and that's about what today's program is and how we try to, to look at different programs to address the, the current situation that we're in to prevent this sooner than later so we're not dealing with problems down the road as far as individuals becoming addicted and using drugs and alcohol uh, to deal with any kind of problems that they may be struggling with. Um, so that's, that's very important. We've done a lot here in the city of Newark over the last really three, four years now with different programs um, addressed to our youth and, uh, and how do we reach out and listen, listen to you and listen to the concerns of the community, what the struggles are, and then how we can work hand in hand with existing coalitions and great people that are already doing good things in, in your communities. So overall, that's, that's how we're structured as far as our core employees. We are in, uh, we have 23 divisions, 239 offices nationally. So our New Jersey division is here in Newark and that covers our whole state. Um, as you, I mentioned before, I, I had the luxury and privilege to serve in Columbia, South America. So we, um, we currently are in 68 different countries throughout the world with uh, 91 offices in those countries. So we have a pretty good footprint and, and representation throughout the world working with those host nations. Um, our relationships, I can speak from my personal experience with the Colombian government, their military, their police, their Navy, their Army. We had phenomenal relationships going back and forth and working on this joint effort to try to reduce the drug supply. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about demand, right? Demand is the usage here in the United States and how high that is. And I've had a lot of good conversations with personal friends, my Colombian friends that I worked with about that. They often would ask me, like, why is there such a demand for drugs in the United States? Because they've gone through some really great sacrifices over the many years to try to help us reduce. And a lot of the drugs are being produced down there. But 
we have a demand, right? And when you bring the cost factor into it, you're going to see why, why people continue to pursue and try to make money off of other people's suffering and addiction. So that's pro programs like this to try to reduce that demand so that folks don't go down that path and become dependent upon these drugs. Boss, so, um, real quick, sorry to interrupt. We have a question from a student who asked um, if you just want to touch on it. Um, what inspired you to work for DEA? Yeah, great question. I mean, we all have our personal reasons for doing it. And for me, it's, you know, I, uh, I want to help people. I want to have impact. Um, I love what our, we're a single mission agency, like some other agencies, the FBI, they may be in, in a lot of different areas, right? Kidnapping, you know, human smuggling, bank robbery, um, counterterrorism. Whereas the DEA, it's just solely dealing with narcotics and drugs. So for me personally, it was that to make a difference, to have impact. And I, I won't lie, I do love the challenge of piecing together an investigation. I love to get a little piece of information and now develop that into an investigation and, and see it through its uh, fruition and have success in it. So that, that's always been a motivator for me. Um, currently, I, I, you know, with 29 years on a job, I, I still look at this as, as a way that I could have impact. There's a lot of people dying, and we'll talk about that as far as this. I like to use the overdose uh, fatality epidemic, really. We talk about the opioid epidemic, but there's other drugs that are killing a lot of people besides the opioids as well. So to have impact and to try to have programs, because we're losing a lot of people, and I'll discuss that a little bit now. On average, um, We'll lose nine people today in our state in New Jersey to a drug overdose. That's a lot, right? Nine people every day. Um, there's a drug, it's called naloxone or Narcan. You may have heard that before. It reverses uh, someone that's succumbing to an overdose. Um, so it's, a, it's given in, through an injection or nasally. And what it literally does is reverses the whole process of a drug overdose because what it is, is the opioid itself, it, it attaches to the brain receptors and it tells the brain shut down, shut down the respiratory system. And most people, they die from that, right? They, they're dying because they can't breathe anymore from an overdose. Um, but let's, I, I would like to just start off with, let's defining what an opioid is, because we're gonna talk about that a lot throughout our conversation today. And I wanna make sure we're all on the same kind of playing field and our understanding of what an opioid is. You hear quite often an opiate and an opioid. You know, for, for our conversation, they're one and the same. Um, the chemical compound of an opiate, typically that's referred more from a plant-based opiate, like heroin per se. It's, it's, uh, it comes from the, uh, the poppy plant and the, uh, the poppy seeds are taken out of the, uh, the poppy plant and uh, it's extracted and there's a chemical process that's done throughout to break that into that substance. But when you look at an opioid, that's synthetic man-made, that is your hydrocodone, your fentanyl, things of that nature that are used within the medical community, right? That's their intended purpose. Uh, fentanyl per se, it's very powerful, very strong. It's about a hundred times more stronger than morphine. Uh, morphine is commonly used as well in hospitals for any kind of surgeries, um, end of life patients, someone that are really suffering. These are very strong narcotics that in essence, they're painkillers. That's the purpose of these drugs is to kill the pain so that people have some type of, you know, they could bear and, and, and go on without pain. Um, we have two questions. Sure. Uh, one question, how many people died from opioids for the last uh, three years? I'm not sure if you mean New Jersey or the whole United States, but, um, and the other question is, what are the signs of a drug overdose? Okay, so the first question as far as the number of overdoses, from a national perspective, we've been around 72,000 per year. Um, in New Jersey, last year, we are just over 3,000, and we're expected to exceed that this year. Um, for some obvious reasons, right? We're, we're, uh, we're dealing with the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of people who haven't been able to get out to get, receive treatment, to go to counseling, to different programs that are helping them deal with, with their struggle of addiction. Um, the anxiety, the stress, a lot of that causes people to use substances to deal with that, that anxiety and pain. So 
we expect our numbers and we've been watching them very closely every week. We get a readout from the medical examiner's office throughout the state as far as where our numbers are, are trending. And unfortunately, they're trending up. We did see a small reduction last year, but we do expect probably this year will be our all time high in the state. Um, so I hope that answers that question. From a national perspective, it is all the states are pretty much dealing with the same epidemic that we are. Um, the naloxone that I touched on that reverses it, that would be administered on average. So we are tracking that with law enforcement and EMS about 40 times a day, 40 to 45 times law enforcement and EMS are administering that and reversing the effects and saving lives of those who are, who are, who are experiencing an overdose. Uh, the symptoms of an overdose, the most obvious is the repressed, depressed breathing, right? That, that's how people actually die, it just shuts off their oxygen. The brain is telling, telling the body shut down so people can't get oxygen to the brain. Um, pale skin, grayish colored skin, um, very lethargic, um, discoloring of the fingers and, and of the toes. And really like you'll just see people like they nod off, like literally a lot of times at an overdose scene, someone will be kind of in a fetal position like bent over with their heads down between their legs because they, they inject the drug. Um, there's, they're there by themselves. There's no one there to help them or call any, any kind of medical assistance. And uh, that's typically how they'll, they'll, they'll just die from lack of oxygen or from, from uh, they'll foam at the mouth. That's another clue out of the nose and the mouth when they start foaming. So there's some of the signs to look for. And this Narcan that we talk about is a true lifesaver. If we could get that, all law enforcement pretty much carry it now. A lot of lay people, what I mean by lay people, for instance, if my son was, was struggling with a, with a heroin addiction, I would have Narcan in my house, right? And so a lot of coalitions, a lot of treatment facilities, um, if, now with some pharmacists that uh, I think it was just passed as law as a matter of fact, that if they're prescribing an opioid and a pharmacy fills that prescription, they also have to provide Narcan to that individual. Um, it's very powerful, it's very powerful. And we talk about that as far as that one pill can kill. Um, it's very addictive and that's what happens is people start out and, and I'll walk through this process on that how we got to where we are. Uh, our, real quick, um, we have a few really good questions in the chat that the students are asking. Okay. Um, the first is, can you sue the hospital that gave you the painkillers if you end up getting addicted? The second is, how long does it take you to become addicted to an opioid? The third is, do you think it will be higher this year due to the fact that everyone is in the house and their stress levels are rising? Interesting. Hey, Chris. So, Chris, also, let me just uh, interject. After you ask, answer the, those three questions, could you take us back to the beginning of this epidemic and where it started and sure. just sort of track the path of the evolution yep. of it and how it started with, yeah. you, know the, you know the story. So, yep, um, absolutely. So the first question, can you sue the hospital? I mean, typically the prescriptions are coming from doctor's offices, right? You come into it, you're having a lot of pain. And we could talk about that, like how do you start? Is it a car accident? Is it a sports injury? Do you break a bone? How do you start where a doctor may prescribe you a, an opioid, right? Typically hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxycontin. They're typical names that you'll hear, Vicodin, as far as strong painkillers, narcotics, opioids, right? They're, they're all in that class. Um, there are a lot of lawsuits now, not so much directed towards doctors. We have investigations against doctors who are doing that. They're just selling these pills and prescriptions for profit. But you're seeing a lot of lawsuits against the big pharma, the pharmaceutical companies who are producing this. And I'll, I'll get into that as far as based on a question that, that Gary just asked how we got here. Um, I'm sorry, what was question two? Um, how long can it take for a person to become addicted? And then the third was, do you think it will be higher this year due to the fact that everyone is in their house and their stress levels are rising? Yeah. Yeah. So question number two is how long that is very dependent on the individual. Some people have a higher tolerance. Um, you know, I've heard, you know, people that, that take opioids that like say that, say you break a bone and, and, and we you have a serious car accident, you end up in a hospital and, and now you're giving fentanyl or, or some type of opioid in a hospital. 
you know, people say within three days, they're starting to feel like they need more, they need more. So you do build up this tolerance quick, right? Because the pain may be so bad, you're taking say 30 milligrams and like, it's not working, I need more. So what happens, you start building up this tolerance. So that's an individual type of, of question based on that person. I've heard it taking people years and other people, it could be within a week, right? We talk about dentists for a time. Our dentists were the highest prescribers of opioids. Who would ever think that, right? Um, you go and get your, uh, your teeth extracted for your wisdom teeth or you're having some kind of a surgical procedure done in your mouth. Dentists were, were really prescribing. Like, uh, you know, I, I've had friends, their, their, their children had uh, their uh, molars removed and it was a 30 day supply. You know, you don't need 30 day supply for, for reasons like that. So that, that is very different on the individual. Um, the third question, 100%, I, I am very concerned about the pandemic and the stress, anxiety and everything that's been going on as far as more people seeking not only drugs, but alcohol as well, just to, to, to kind of deal with this situation to ease anxiety. And I think that's important that we always have to remember. We can put that Band-Aid on and say, oh, let me have a drink, let me smoke a joint, let me, let me do whatever, I'm gonna feel good in a moment, I'm gonna feel good for a couple hours, but you're coming back to whatever that is, that problem, that, that stress, that anxiety, it's still gonna be there tomorrow or the day after. Um, so that, that's not always, it's never really the best solution to go down that path and think that, that that's gonna solve the problem. Um, let me address how we got here. And I got Gary, that's a great question because I think it's very significant because as to the opioid epidemic, like we're almost 25 years into this and a lot of people don't realize that it's been going on that long. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever eat bagels or poppy seeds, but they're one of my favorites. So I just wanna let you know. Um, let's go back to the mid 1990s. And uh, 1996, really, there's three things. I like to call it the perfect storm because three things aligned perfectly that kind of got us where we are. One is the role of drug traffickers in Mexico, right? We've always had that our southwest border and the, uh, the connection of, of smuggling coming up into the United States, whether it's marijuana, cocaine, heroin, um, so what happened was the Mexican drug traffickers, historically our, our, our heroin in the Northeast in the United States is a very pure heroin. It's, it's got a very good quality. It's a white heroin. There's two types of heroin, a black tar heroin. It's of a lesser grade. It's like a tarry, sticky substance. And the West Coast of the United States predominantly was the user base for black tar heroin. We don't have that here in the Northeast. Ours was a much refined, good quality heroin that came directly from Colombia. In the mid 1990s, Mexican drug trafficking organizations said, you know, we don't need to be dependent upon the Mexicans any, uh, upon the Colombians anymore. We can, we can produce our own poppy. We'll extract our own poppy seeds and process the, uh, the and, and transform this into heroin and get it up the Southwest border and we'll be seek all the profits. So about five years ago, this transition really started to take effect where we have now, well, it took back in the late 90s, but now about 95% of our heroin is of Mexican origin. So the Colombians are pretty much out of that whole heroin business. They're producing a lot of cocaine still, but not the, not the heroin. So the role of the Mexican drug traffickers where they would go into smaller towns, not like in New York, New York or Philadelphia, Baltimore, these were historically uh, strong user population of heroin and they were locked down but what they went into small like a Boise Idaho or Cheyenne or different places throughout Appalachia West Virginia and Ohio and they would literally just set up a customer base and deal deliver heroin right to your door you would call a phone number and say I need this this amount and they go and deliver it right to your house um, so we started building up a user base of more heroin at the same time, we had pharmaceutical companies aggressively marketing these opioids, in particular oxycotton, hydrocodone, and hydrocodone, as the solution. Like any pain, regardless, no one should experience any pain. That we should, a broke, like we talked about, a broken arm 
uh, tooth extraction. No one should experience any pain. We have a pill for that. There's no reason for anyone to suffer. Let's get the pills out. So they, there's a lot of aggressive advertising and marketing to the medical community, in particular doctors, that they should be prescribing these opioids to their, to their patients. Well, the doctors, they were basing off one small study and they, uh, the doctors bought in and they just started prescribing, you know, some of them over prescribing. And I'm not pleased, I'm not targeting doctors. This is the information that they had at the time. And they're like, hey, this is, we don't want our patients to suffer. Our patients don't want to suffer. So let's get this stuff out and, and prescribe it more frequently. So we had that aggressive campaign by, by Big Pharma and then we had doctors buying into it and then we had an abundant supply and I think you spoke about it in your last conversation as far as the chemical compound of a heroin over to an opioid. So when the doctor started prescribing the, the, the opioid pills and say, uh, you know, I was getting prescribed and now my ailment went away, my, my, my bones healed and I'm not, I don't need them anymore, but I built up this dependency. Doctor's not prescribing them anymore. What do I do? I, I need to have this, this drug in my system because now I'm dependent on it. I go out to the street and I start buying heroin. So a pill could cost anywhere out on the street, you know, up to $30 a pill, and I could go buy a bag of heroin for $5. So we had this transition. A lot of people became addicted to the opioids and then they went out to the street and started seeking heroin because the chemical compound and makeup of a pill to the heroin is very, very similar. Um, so we had that transition and now we had more and more folks that were being addicted to these strong and powerful opioids. And we do a lot with the treatment uh, partners. And I go into facilities here in Newark and elsewhere and talk to, um, hey, we okay, see, Gary? So I just put up the chemical compound. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, so that's a great depiction there. You can see how, how very similar to heroin is to hydrocodone and oxycodone, then, right? There's not much of a difference. All right. So we had this whole buildup of folks going out into the street and becoming dependent. And uh, so that started to really, you know, boost up our overdoses, our overdoses and our overdose fatalities. So that those three elements came together and then we continued to progress. Um, do we have the resources that we need to address, you know, folks in treatment? No, and there's problems with insurance where they don't have insurance. Some of the insurance only pays for, you know, a certain amount of days. And this is a very, very difficult addiction to get over. It's not something that you just two weeks and you're, you're clean. Um, and, and for most people, it haunts them for the rest of their lives. It's a lifelong struggle. Um, and it's very um, to, to repeat. And a lot of people going in and out of treatment throughout their journey of life is it's very common. Um, but we have a few questions. Of course. A lot of them. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you want me to read one and then you answer or how do yeah, you want to be helpful. Okay, so the first is, and you mentioned it a little bit, but if you just want to reiterate, what is considered the gateway um, tooth extraction, sports injury, recreational drug use, if you want to answer that. Yeah, so we, we, we hear this term a lot, gateway, right? We always heard about marijuana, alcohol, marijuana, and then now you're going to take that leap into some a harder drug. For some people, that is the path, right? Um, I get, like I mentioned before, when we go into treatment facilities, we want to learn, we want to listen. So we're very interested in people's journey and, and how they got to where they are. Um, everyone pretty much to a T says they start with alcohol, and marijuana. Um, there's others that have done that and, and, you know, just stopped. So I'm not going to say with 100% certainty, if you smoke a joint, your next step is you're going to be shooting, putting a needle in your arm, uh, shooting up heroin. That, that, that's not accurate. And I, I'm not going to espouse that and say that that's, that's the path. But the gateway with the opioid epidemic, 100% was the pills to heroin, right? That's very well documented um, from numerous scientific studies and, and, and treatment facilities and individuals that went down that path. So, yeah, that gateway is, is very, very established as far as the pills to heroin. And we'll talk about fentanyl. Um, but that gateway, yeah, is the most strongest as far as where we are with the opioid epidemic. Okay, the next question is, um, what is the success rate of Narcan? It's very, very good, very high. Um, sometimes with the fentanyl now, uh, why don't I just speak about this now then, because I keep 
touching on fentanyl. What is fentanyl? Fentanyl is a we we mentioned it briefly. It's very very strong and powerful opioid. It's used in operating rooms. Like I said, end of life patients who are who are struggling with cancer. It's very powerful. But what we had was um, the drug traffickers. Now the heroin, you know, that was very it's very available out in the streets. And what they started to do is infuse fentanyl, powdered fentanyl, into the heroin supply. So someone who's, a, who's struggling and addicted and say, I take 10 bags of heroin a day and that 11th bag I want to take now, but now there's fentanyl in there. I'm accustomed to using this dosage of heroin that I know my body, I know, I know my body and I know, okay, I use 10 bags a day. Well, I go and use the 11th bag on, on tomorrow and now that bag has fentanyl in it, which is much more powerful than the heroin. And it ends up putting me in, in an overdose situation where my body can't handle that amount of opioid, right? We, we discussed that opioid attaches to the brain, the brain receptors, and it's saying shut down, shut down the body, re depress the, the, the breathing and respiration. Um, so the role of fentanyl has been significant. We saw that in 2013 is when it really came onto the scene. Um, we see the, if I had a chart, you would see a spike that literally went up this way. Like it wasn't even like on an angle. It went right up as far as the fentanyl deaths and the amount of fentanyl that we started to see when we get our uh, reports back from the laboratory that was in heroin exhibits. We submit it, we think it's heroin, we submit it as heroin, and the lab comes back and says, you know, it was really fentanyl. So that played a very significant role and it continues down. And why the cost of fentanyl is relatively cheap compared to heroin. Um, it goes a lot further. So it, if I'm a drug trafficker and I have a kilogram, kilogram is 2.2 pounds. It's kind of like a brick shape, you know, about that big, um, about that, that thick. And uh, I'll get that of heroin and then I'll get some fentanyl and mix it in there because I want that to go as far as I can and get more dosage units when I go and sell it out on the street so I can make more money. And, uh, that's what we've seen, this infusion of fentanyl into the drug supply where people don't know what they're taking anymore. And now they, they're getting a much stronger opioid. Particularly uh, is very vulnerable are people coming out of prison, people coming out of treatment, whereas they've been clean and now they, they're still not past that addiction. And they go back out on the street and said, oh, I was taking five bags of heroin before I went into prison or before I went into treatment. They go out and use the same five bags thinking it's heroin, but it's really fentanyl and they end up overdosing. So that population is very vulnerable when they come out. Okay, um, you answered it, but if you just wanna go over it again really quickly, what happens when an opioid addict runs out of opioids? What do they transition to? Yeah, so let's talk about withdrawal, right? That's kind of what leads up to it. Um, speaking to people, and, and uh, there's some great shows. I don't know if anyone, you can put your hands up. Anyone ever watch that show? I don't know if it's on A&E. It's called uh, Intervention. Anybody ever see that show? Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's very interesting. They, they literally, it's a documentary where they follow someone around who's struggling with addiction, and, and you can see the withdrawal when they don't have their supply and the, what they do to try to go out and get drugs uh, just to sustain it. So the withdrawal, talking to folks who struggle and been through it, they say it is the worst feeling you could ever imagine. And every day is that they live, they wake up in the morning. It's like, how am I going to get my next fix? How am I going to get my next dosage unit? Because my body needs it and, and just wants it so bad that I will do anything, literally anything. And, and, that show kind of depicts what, what people do in, in, in real life, right? Prostitution, stealing from family, from businesses, um, selling anything that they can, just doing, doing things that they would never, ever imagine. But this addiction just controls every thought in their head. And that's how they live their lives. I need that next dosage because I don't want to feel so bad and so miserable. And they, they equate it to like being, having the flu, and a hundred times worse than the flu, how bad it makes their bodies feel. They ache, um, just their body just shuts down until they get that next fix. And that's an interesting point to make as well. Everyone, they always say that first time they use it, the high is amazing. They feel it's euphoria, right? It's just something that they've never felt before. But after that, it's gone. 
like they don't feel that euphoria anymore. It's just a matter of trying to feel normal because your body is yearning for that drug to be in its system. So really they don't even get the pleasure out of the, of the drug anymore. It's just to sustain the trying to feel some kind of normalcy and get by every day. Did that answer the question? Um, I think so. Uh, David, you're the one who asked if you want to speak for yourself. I don't want to speak for you. I think you're well, on mute. I, I, just, I just have experience with friends who've lost their children, uh, and they all started on opioids, alcohol generally, and then opioids, and then it transitioned to heroin. And uh, the devastation on these families is, I mean, I've seen it firsthand from friends who've lost their children. Yeah. yeah. No, Dave, that's a good point. I mean, as far as the devastation of the family structure and um, what parents, what siblings, right? All the attention is focused on the individual struggling with that addiction, but the family's going through the same pain and suffering, um, you know, trying to help and feeling hopeless, trying to get them treatment spending their life savings to get people, their, their family members into treatment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it is a horrible curse that, that, that people deal with that it's happening every day. And, and don't think that any demographic is immune to this. I mean, I don't care if you're wealthy, if you're poor, if you live in the inner city, if you live in a suburb, what your profession is. I have a good friend of mine an agent for 28 years. His son struggled for nine years, right? From addiction and finally died. Um, he, had, he was Narcan nine times throughout his nine year struggle with, with addiction. So think about that, nine times that his life was saved in and out of treatment. And this isn't it, right? The perception, here's a drug enforcement agent. No way, his son would never, but don't ever think that. It happens to cops, it happens to nurses, doctors, it happens to social workers. It's across the board. So don't think that anyone's immune from this or any, any one culture or, or where you live has that impact. It really impacts everyone. Um, so the next question is if you just, um, cause we have about 20 minutes left, 23 specifically. Um, is there a stronger drug they can depend on? I'm assuming they're talking about fentanyl, um, heroin or opioids. And you mentioned it briefly with the fentanyl. Yeah. I mean, fentanyl is the pretty much there's the, you, you hear there's other stuff called parafentanyl and there's all these different, um, I'm not a chemist by any by any stretch of the imagination. Actually, I failed chemistry. I'll, I'll admit that in high school. So, <laughs> I, uh, you know, there they, these class of drugs. I mean, there's a lot of different fentanyls. Carfentanil, you may have heard it in the news. Uh, you know, it's an animal tranquilizer, and it is one of the most powerful fentanyls. So it's used to treat big game like elephant and rhinos and all like veterinarians use it. And we've seen that in a drug supply, but not with any frequency or in abundance. So that would be something the probably the most powerful, powerful type of opioid. We don't see it that often. And also I should acknowledge like all this fentanyl that we're seeing is synthetic, right? It's being produced in a laboratory. So the majority of our fentanyl is coming from China and Mexico. And these are, these are labs, you know, fentanyl in China was never regulated because they don't have a problem there. It wasn't even a controlled substance. Um, they can, they changed their laws to control it based on our epidemic here. Um, but all that comes in predominantly powder form up from pretty much the Southwest border or via air shipments from, uh, from China. So that's the origin where, where it's coming from. Okay, so the next question is, is there, is it the physical dependence that makes it hard to get over the addiction or is it the mental dependency? Both emotional, physical, psychological. I think the physical, right? I mean, it, it is uh, to, um, uh, what's the word? It's um, to, uh, when you're uh, Joanna or Caitlin, help me out. What is it when you're uh, to avoid withdrawal and you go in to, to get off the drug, to get out of your system? Oh, suboxone? Suboxone? Not the drug, the process. Oh, um, uh, 
Detox. Detox. Sorry, I was drawing a mental block. Yeah, so when you go into detox, right, that's the idea to remove that chemical physically out of your body, right, to get it out of your system. So, yeah, you could have that out of your system, and that could take, you know, probably about a week for the, de for the detox to happen. But there's triggers, right? We talk about triggers and we talk about trauma. And I want to get into that. We really didn't talk about much about trauma. Um, but these triggers that will take an individual right back to going to use again, right? Like what got them down that path to begin with and, and how, why they became so dependent upon it, right? We talked about that dealing with something emotionally, physically, psychologically. Um, trauma is a big one. And I want to talk about that real quick. I know we're, we're, we're running on time. We, we devised a program that we've been in. We didn't devise it. We actually stole it from somewhere else. And, and it, to really look at trauma, and there's, there's a lot of studies. It's called adverse childhood experiences. And, and think about, you know, you could think back in your own life or someone you know. A traumatic event is anything. It could be the divorce of your parents. It could be seeing a parent get arrested. It could be seeing your dog hit by a car. It could be, you know, an overdose, a shooting. You, you know, trauma is different for all of us. But these studies have gone on to show like people who expo were exposed to this traumatic event that goes unattended where you, you, you try to, you internalize it and just trying to deal with it yourself, right? You're, you're like, oh, I could deal with this. I'm tough. You know, I, I'm, I could get through this. I'll suck it up. But really that's still there in your subconscious and you're struggling with it, right? And you never talked to anybody about it. You didn't seek any professional help or a friend or a family member. And now you have another traumatic event. And this builds up and this builds up. Well, these studies have shown that people who experience these traumatic events that go unattended and don't get attention and address them, the probability of them seeking drugs and alcohol to deal with that trauma is very, very high. Um, so that's really important that we need to seek out help when we're struggling with something. And we talked, there's a good question about that with the pandemic now with anxiety and stress and you know, there are people out there, you just have to find them. And whether it's a friend or family member or professional services that could help you, you know, with that, those types of trauma. And so we've been doing a program. We started here in Newark. Newark Police Department comes upon a scene of a child that is at a, a, a traumatic event. They take the name, age, and the school that the child goes to so that we can notify the school. It doesn't give any details or specifics, right? Johnny, you know, mom got arrested last night. It doesn't talk about that. It just says, handle Johnny with care. So when Johnny goes to school the next day, the, 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 the teachers and, and the educators can then keep an eye on them. They're not going to be just going, hey, Johnny, I, I heard something happen or what's wrong? No, they're going to keep an eye on Johnny. And if Johnny's acting out and he's getting into fights or he's crying in a corner, now they could get the you know, school nurse or a teacher that's trusted that Johnny knows and just start engaging that conversation and get Johnny the help that he needs to get through that traumatic event. So uh, we've been working hard on that program. And this is one of the, we look at, if we get addressed this early on, we look at it as a prevention program. If we get addressed this trauma early on, then maybe young, young ad teens and adolescents and adults won't go down that path seeking substances to deal with that pain. So that's just one, uh, one example of the role that trauma plays with addiction. Um, so we have a lot of questions and we have about 15 minutes left. Right. Um, what answers? <laughs> we have a little bit less than 15. We got uh, yeah. Is there so, a known alternative to opioids that a doctor could prescribe or give to you when you go into surgery if you're worried about getting addicted? Yeah. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, there are things like, I know a lot of dentists now are just prescribing like extra strength Tylenol and things like that, where they're not giving an opioid. But when there's major surgeries and things like that, I, I, doctors are still inclined to use opioids. But there's a long questionnaire that like, if you struggle with addiction before, there are some things that I, that doctors can use uh, to avoid putting opioids into the system. But I, I can't speak with great, uh, familiarity or detail on that, but I have heard of that. Would someone who is addicted to opioids inject themselves with needles to get a quicker high, or would it be the same effect if they were to take it by mouth? Yeah. Yeah. So typically the progression is that you, you could either smoke it or pretty much ingest it by mouth. And then you progress to intravenous sticking, you know, putting a needle into the veins because that gets it directly into the system and the high, you know, that, that, 
feeling is immediate, right? Whereas if you ingested it through the mouth, it would take a little bit longer to go through the whole digestive process. Um, and folks, what happens is they, they start, you know, they find a, a good vein and they continue to use that. And then they got to move on because that vein will start to, to, uh, to dissipate and you know, atrophy. And, you know, people put it in their carotid artery here in between toes. I mean, wherever they could find a, a good, a good artery to stick it in a good vein to stick it in. Um, which then leads to a lot of problems with hepatitis and, and cysts and, and abscesses and things like that. So there's a lot of other health consequences that come along with that intravenous use. Can you die going through withdrawal if your body isn't strong enough to go through it? You cannot. From my understanding that, no, the, the withdrawal, it's the, the detox will not kill you itself, right? That's my understanding and talking to folks that are in the treatment space that the detox itself won't kill you, but you need, you need some medical attention to go through that. I've heard people just locking themselves in a room and detoxing themselves. They have done that. It's very, very difficult. And I don't think from a medical standpoint that that's the recommended way. Um, how long does it take for the body to completely shut down after an overdose? It could be instant. It could be depending on the amount, and like I said, and, and the purity and strength of it. If it's fentanyl, it could shut down as soon as it's injected. Um, sorry, there's there's so many. <laughs> Have you experienced a situation where a person you know has become addicted? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think it's a battle of the strong and weak? Because some people who've been through worse end up using their pain to do better things that lead them away from drugs. That's a good question. I, um, unfortunately, there is a stigma, right? That people are morally weak and why does someone take drugs? And it's a very, very complex problem. And, and uh, you know, we've devised these teams that study this, right? And we look at overdose fatalities. One, there's some things that always come out when we do these reviews. We call them social autopsies, right? We, we look at the journey of an individual who struggled with drugs throughout their life and ultimately died from the drug overdose. And we look at it from all perspectives, from medical, education, um, predisposition, everything. However, you get probation, parole, health and human services, um, law enforcement, treatment, prevention, Anyone that you could think would have touched that individual's life, we have sitting around a table to discuss this. There are some things that are very, very common in all these reviews that we do. It's generational. It goes from one generation to the next where there may be a dysfunctional family and, and parents and siblings are using drug and alcohol in the house. That's very common in these reviews that we do. Trauma, very, very common you know, what led people to do, you know, go down that path because they're trying to get away from that trauma, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse. How do I deal with my life every day? They go down that path. So some of those, there are common threads that we see throughout these reviews that are, that we see that are um, consistent in folks who struggle and ultimately uh, die from an overdose. Okay, so we have three left. How strong are drug laws and regulations in America? How strong are drug laws? Um, and regulation. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of a broad question. I guess I would answer it like there's different sides to that. People will look at some of our drug laws, like on marijuana. Let's take that for example. They're, right? Should someone be getting locked up for a joint or five joints? No, they shouldn't be. Right? So people will look at that and say, you know what, maybe that's not the way that's intended to be. Um, if you have someone with multi kilograms that are just trying to profit, they don't use the drug themselves, but they're taking advantage of other people who, who they perceive as weak or those that they can prey upon. Yeah, those drug laws should be should be strong to, to prosecute those people. And, you know, there has to be a deterrent. There has to be some recourse as far as people not taking advantage of the vulnerable. So it's a broad question. I think we could kind of dissect it as far as different drugs, different examples, and where it applies and where it doesn't. So does our agency do any work to alter legislation that would limit or even uh, eradicate the legal mass production and distribution of opioids through our healthcare system? Yeah, good question. Um, does the DEA help to promote legislation? 
I'll give you an example. Senator Booker here, that is uh, one of our senators in the state of New Jersey and, and uh, a native of Newark. One of his staffers called me two days ago, not yesterday, the day before, to check in. Hey, what can you tell me? Anything going on? Any kind of trends? What are you seeing? So we do work with uh, our, our legislative representatives on that, where we give our input. Obviously, we're not, we can't lobby or we're not, we're not in that position. That's not our role. Um, but we do give advice and, and talk about trends and, and give our insight as far as what we see and what are the threats. On that point, I just want to make this because a lot of folks, you know, want to direct maybe their frustration or anger or their disagreement with laws towards law enforcement. And, and we enforce, we don't make them, right? So it's your legislators. It's the folks that are out there making these laws. Like we talk about marijuana and should someone be going to jail for, for selling, you know, for, for having five joints on them. The DEA or any, any of your local police officers don't make up those rules, right? We're enforcing what our legislative body has decided on. So I just want to make that point. Like we're, sometimes we, you know, we're the first line of defense or a police officer in uniform who comes upon a scene. Like the, the people may take out their anger or anguish on that individual, but we're not the ones that are making the laws. We're enforcing them, right? And like to my point, we do give our insight and we do provide our best opinions and guidance. Sometimes that's not necessarily followed. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Two of them I'm gonna link together just because we're running out of time and do Sue asked a really great question and I told her I wanted to save it for last. Um, so the two I'm gonna to link together, do you think school pressure plays a role in the use of drugs in the life of teenagers? And do you think stress from home is one of the big factors when it comes to teens using drugs? So school and home would be the connection. Uh, both, yes, 100%. Listen, I am a very, very strong pro proponent of the the family nucleus and structure. And unfortunately, right, that's not everyone's situation, right? And other, and some folks have more struggles than others. And I get it and I understand that. Um, so I think a, a sound family life and, and good morals and, 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 and mentorship from parents or, or guardians or siblings is critical, right? Um, it influenced my life quite a bit. And, and I think that's important. And, and again, right, the, well, there's that saying is, you know, the folks, the friends that you hang out with is who you are and or who you become. So selection of, of good role models of good friends and, and caring friends that, that truly have your best interests at heart, both are critical like that. If you're feeling stress, isn't it great to be able to text or pick up the phone, TikTok or whatever you guys are doing now, um, to a friend that you could, that you could trust and you get that feedback and that they help you. So yeah, that, that's all very important. And they can, both of those school and, uh, and family can be a factor as to why people use substances 100%. So I saved you this question for last because I think it's a great way to end since we're pretty much out of time. Um, if big pharmaceutical companies, big pharma, is still at large after all of the lawsuits and complaints, how do we effectively combat the crisis? Um, well, I think big pharma is on notice. There are, I, I lost count as far as the number of lawsuits that are directed towards some of these pharmaceutical companies right now, which are billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, obviously they've their greed has made them profits over the years um, in the billions and billions of dollars. Um, they are being held accountable. I would personally like to see them be held more accountable criminally, right? They got deep pockets and yeah, the states are suing them to, uh, to recover some of the costs for treatment and loss of life and services that a city or a county or a state have committed to helping those struggling with addiction. So yeah, you're going to see a lot of money coming out of big pharma to pay out in these lawsuits. Like one in particular already declared bankruptcy. The, the biggest culprit to this, one of the biggest culprits to this problem already declared bankruptcy. Um, so personally, I would like to see them held more accountable criminally that, you know, they, they, they know what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing as far as getting people addicted to these drugs so that they could sell more pills. So um Unfortunately, there's a lot of 
money involved in this and lobbyists and political agendas and it goes on and on. We need about 10 more uh, Zoom sessions to get into all the, the details of that because it is very complicated. But uh, I, I think we'll see the day where, where folks will be held accountable. Chris, uh, I just wanna, I wanna ask uh, one, one last question here. Uh, we've talked a lot about a, a lot of things. If you just had to distill it down to a couple of things, what would you, what do you want the kids to focus on? What's the most important message? What are some of the most important messages? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think to boil it down, Gary would be, I don't know if there is one, one particular message. It's that, you know, choices. How do we decide? I, I like to use a statement, the choices that we make and the chances that we take define our destiny, right? And one bad choice can really set you on a path that, may not, you may not be able to return from. And, you know, we talked about fentanyl pills and pills that counterfeit mm -hmm. pills that are out in, in, in society right now and out in the street. You know, what is that pill? You may think it's an Adderall. You may think it's, uh, you know, MDMA or ecstasy or whatever, but do you really know what's in that pill? And it could be a fentanyl pill and that one pill could alter your life. It could end your life. So I think that, you know, I would end on that. It's, it's about making good choices. It's about thinking before we act, which is very hard in our society today because a lot of it is instant gratification and social media and things of that nature. But uh, I think the most important thing is that, like take that little second and say, is this, is this the right choice to make? Um, and that's what I try to instill in my children is that choice that you're making may not be retractable. Right, and, and I equate it to like shooting a gun, right? You, sh you pull that trigger and that bullet goes out. There's, you're never ever getting it back, right? So I think that's important. I just use that as a quick analogy from a law enforcement perspective, but make a good choice. Take time to think it through and then go from there and, and rely on your family and friends and guidance or, or, or guardians and people that you look up to that you wanna emulate. Chris, thank you. I, I just want to thank you uh, so much for talking with us. <laughs> Before we, we did our pre thing, we were worried about getting enough questions. Um, that, no. <laughs> that didn't happen today. So that's, that's a good thing. It was, it was engaging and, and thank you for your message. Um, just want to, we're, we're going to end on time guys, because I promise you this when I talked to you at first. So uh, we're going to take an hour and we are two minutes away from that. So I just want to thank again, everybody for, for coming. This is an important, program we need your voice and I'm talking to the students and I'm talking to the people watching too so yeah. this is a this is a collective effort in order to to deal with this scourge so just one minute before we have the kids hang up Joanna if you want to before you have to hop off sure so we got a question on Tuesday that was addressing um does I think it was um um does can drug abuse cause Alzheimer's which is very interesting uh so we didn't know that so we took some time to research it and while there's no direct link to drug abuse and Alzheimer's in, in particular, um, they showed, and there's a lot of um, articles, and we can send you the articles that show that if you use drugs over a long period of time, it can really mess up your brain and then cause memory disorders such as Alzheimer's, dementia, and just other things that mess up your brain. So I hope that answered that person's question, and we'll send you the article as well that dives into all the scientific detail on that. All right. So once once again, thanks. Thanks, Joanna. Um, thank you for everybody for coming. Um, our next session, guys, is uh, Tuesday at two o'clock. Uh, be in the waiting room by one forty-five. Anybody have any questions? Email me. We'll we'll get them addressed. And uh, again, thank you for coming. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. Thank you guys, awesome job. Awesome, awesome questions. Day. You guys have a nice day too. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. So interesting how fast that goes. Yeah. I think. Uh, wow. I'm gonna end it for oh, all, and then we can come back and. Sorry,